Good morning again, everyone. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing this young man, and uh, I have great hope for our future. Look at somebody and say amen. And uh, we have had just tremendous conversation over the last couple of days, and we played golf yesterday morning. It was fun. And uh, so, Jake Stringer, come up here and feel your liberty and freedom, and uh, let us have it. In a good way, of course. <laughs> All right. Wow. Um, you know, six years ago, I was building a fire with my two-year-old son in the backyard, and we had built this glorious fire, and I was standing there holding my precious little guy's uh, uh, hand, and we were, you know, admiring the fire we just made together, and Holy Spirit said, would you throw him in that? And I was like, uh, and then he did the obligatory, had to say something to me three times. You don't have to raise your hand, but I know me. He has to say things to me at least three times. Um, and then I began to say, absolutely not. I would never do that. And it, if anything, I'd go in there so he didn't have to. And, uh, and uh, if you put that bridge back up, if you could do that, the bridge of reckless love, you know, that was probably the fourth or fifth major lie that that father was tearing down in my life. You know, we sing these lyrics, uh, the one about the lie, uh, tearing down the lies. Even, uh, right, we sing these lyrics and like, what if we really let him do that? You know, speaking to the body of Christ, you know, uh, and sometimes there's a, there's a price to pay. There's a lot to lose if you let him tear down certain walls. Uh, you know, uh, if the structure you've built is of a certain size, it becomes increasingly proportionally scarier to adventure with Jesus as he tears down lies. So I get it. You know, I've had a church. I've had to count that cost of doing a series on eternal torment. I know I can just say that freely here. And uh, I was in a small town with 20,000 people. And so, you know, the church is, we were already preaching grace and new covenant. So they already kind of wanted us out of there. But you know, um, you you poke on rapture. Uh, you know, I did a, a series on eschatology, and uh, which you all have been through that years ago, because Terry's pioneering and Robin are pioneering, and they they really know him, um, and they follow him. Yes. And aren't you thankful? Yes. You know, I know I am because I'm every theological shift I make and every lie Father tears down. I'm like, I'm not going to have any friends on this next transition. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> and then I meet Terry and Robin and uh, Jessica and Ashley and Paul and Jake <laughs> and Craig. See, I'm, I'm pretty good. Um, and, uh, and I'm just so thankful to know people that are on this journey. It's really, it's really about the relationships, isn't it? And we were talking about the kingdom last night and how the kingdom, I believe, is a three-strand cord. It's theological. It's practical and it's relational. And so a lot of us, we, we have really unpacked the theological strand of the kingdom. And today I want to get on the relational strand a little bit, if I can. But we launch off of the theological strand, a lot of us that have been indoctrinated. Then Holy Spirit has to deal with our theological beliefs, right? But then at some point, and we talked about this a little bit last night, um, at some point, we have to be able to apply it. And then we have to apply it relationally. And we've all been hurt. You know, and I was talking to Father about what to share this morning, and then a couple people have come up and mentioned to me something that we touched on last night. Uh, and it was confirmation because this morning I was kind of like, okay, I think we're going to go there. We're at least going to launch there. Um, and so I want to go to Mark chapter 2, and, uh, and we'll start here. You know, that's my prayer for the body of Christ, is to allow Father to really tear down the lies and to boldly go forward as He does that, because He replaces it with a superior truth. 
um, deconstruction is, is kind of popular right now, but I've found that as I deconstructed a lot of these lies, that if I didn't reconstruct something in its place, disillusionment would happen. And so people, uh, what happens is people think they're losing their faith completely, but they're only losing, losing that version of their faith that is no longer viable. And, and because we've been indoctrinated to believe that you, essentially we window shop churches. It's like going to the mall. And you've already got in mind what you already believe. And you're looking for a preacher or a church that's teaching everything you already believe. And you're looking, you're walking down, you know, you're seeing all the stores, you're passing Foot Locker Church and, you know, American Eagle Church, and they're all preaching different stuff. And, uh, you know, you get to Banana Republic Church, and that they're preaching what, that. yep, okay, that's my church. And then you go there because they're preaching what you already believe and confirming you in your beliefs, whether they're lies or truth. And the, the leadership of the church gets locked in. Um, You know, I hold a a meeting at my house called uh, the Las Vegas Theological Society. And the thought is, it's kind of corny, but, you know, what we talk about in Vegas stays in Vegas. And I wanted, uh, I have a, we're not super close, but we've talked a decent amount. Jeff Turner and I have talked about how he really wished he had had a safe place to talk to other people as he was transitioning theologically. And so I created that uh, meeting at my house. And we have a couple pastors come that, I mean, church can't know they're there. And there's so much to lose. And because if, if the board finds out, or that's a real situation, a lot of, and so if there's a salary there, and we got to be real about this stuff, you know, there's a lot of risk for them uh, financially. And it's a tough call, man, because you got to ask yourself who you're following. But it's so hard, and that's why I'm so thankful for the launch pad of a grace revelation, a, a no condemnation revelation. Because even if, if that guy or that girl decides never to shift, because and they stay in that cage with golden handcuffs on, um, God's not mad at them and there's no condemnation. <laughs> Loves them right there, and he lives with them in it. You know? And uh, so if we get to Mark chapter 2, It says in verse 1, it says, And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. That's exciting when you hear Jesus is in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive. And even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four or four men, And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So sometimes you have to take the ceiling off to get to Jesus where he's actually at. So the New Testament is entitled the New Testament, right? So new to who? It's 2,000 years old to us. So it was a New Testament compared, it's relative, newness is relative to what you're coming from, right? So it's new compared to the Jewish scriptures, right? Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. So I can't find a verse. I can be free here, right? Do you believe that God has stopped speaking? Even if we went to the most fundamental, where I'm from, we have regular Baptists and irregular Baptists and slightly abnormal Second Baptists and uh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Third Baptist, Thirteenth Street Baptists, and we have a lot of different denominations, and it's great, good people, you know. And I'm sure people are being helped. We're here to build, not to tear down. Amen. I am thankful I'm out of that, and I have love for for people still there. Um, and we have uh, these this New Testament. But regardless of denomination, if I was to ask your average Christian, do you believe God is done speaking, most would say no. There are some people that believe yes, he's done. That which is perfect has come, right? And they mean the Bible. Uh, And then I say, which one? The first one had 80 books, you know, and the second one had 73. It's only had 66 since like the mid-19th century, 1850s. Um, And so many times we assume what, what is current when 
with what we're born into is just, we just assume it's always been that way. Uh, and we know it hasn't. So most people agree God's not done speaking, but we're also double-minded because we believe the New Testament is a ceiling. But sometimes you have to take the ceiling off to get to where Jesus is at. And that's not to say Jesus is not in the New Testament. Absolutely not. All I'm saying is that God's not done speaking. So if we look, oh man, I feel, I feel like Lynn Hiles. I feel the Holy Ghost, you know. We'll get to Mark 2 in a second, but I want to just, if you can picture this beautiful trajectory that, that Jesus has taken humanity on, the law to us, relative to where we're at, seems like crazy levels of bondage, doesn't it? But that's relative to where we're at. But compared to Egypt, it was liberating. Because liberation is relative to where you just got liberated from, right? So Moses, you know, delivers, who's a, a picture of Christ, right? He delivers them from a place of bondage unto a place of less bondage, increased liberation. But what was once liberating eventually became confining. Okay? Okay. So I touched on the launch pad of a grace revelation. I never imagined. I thought grace changed my life. A new covenant revelation of no condemnation changed my life so dramatically. I thought there could, there's no way there's more than this. I mean, you may know what I mean. When I realized, oh my gosh, my salvation is secure. I'm not on the yo-yo. I don't lose it and regain it according to my religious performance. You mean Jesus really did it? I'm saved by works, or sorry, saved by faith, uh, by grace, by, uh, saved by grace, not of works. Uh, I, my boast is in him. That whole grace revelation was so liberating compared to where I'd been that I thought it can't get any better than this. And it does. Because you know what? Jesus is in the roofing business. He's always ripping ceilings off. So he's a carpenter, right? He can unframe it and reframe it in a stronger manner than what you had before. But it's pretty scary to be safe in your form that you're in and Jesus to come and take the roof off. Well, now all this stuff starts pelting you that you were protected from. And then he just methodically starts reframing the roof. And you're like, I don't know if I'm this patient. <laughs> I'm getting pelted with a lot of stuff. Yeah. And he's framing. He's got his framing hammer in his hand. And he's like, trust me, it's going to be better. It's going to be better. It's going to be even more liberating. So the law of Moses was liberating compared to Egypt. But guess what? That new form eventually became confining. You are at this church because you, you have had this happen to you repeatedly in your life. Look back on your theological journey, if we hang out on the theological strand of the kingdom for a second, and I guarantee you can think back how liberating a certain revelation was. And then at some time, you're like, man, it's getting tight in here. My, my daughter, Journey, she's five. Her name's Journey James. She's amazing. Uh, I'm totally in love with both my daughters. I have no chance against them. Uh, they are so precious. But Journey... Because she is constantly growing, she needs new shoes every six months or so. So because growth is present, a new form is required periodically. But in Christianity, essentially, we've been indoctrinated to believe once you get to that church where they got their doctrine right, you think you, you put your stakes in the ground and you live at, at camp whatever, Till the day you die. You know, like I have a friend, uh, a dear friend from high school, and he just, like six years ago, he called me and he said, man, we found the house we're going to die in. And I let him get through with his monologue. And I go, dude, you're 32. What do you mean? Fixation is powerful. You know, there's a, there's a relationship between fixation and the exiting of wisdom. 
Have you ever fixated on anything to the point that your wisdom kind of just totally leaves you? <laughs> because you're, I mean, you don't have to raise your hand, but it could be a person, it could be a car, a house. And he said, you know, and he's an engineer and makes a, you know, has a really great salary and his wife's a teacher and they make a lot of money. And they found this house and they moved everything in their life around financially to get this house. And even though they made like over $200,000, he had like $5 done at the end of the month because of he had fixated on this house to the point where they made a lot of unwise decisions to get this house. Wisdom left because fixation was taken over. And they got the house, and I'm telling you, six months later, I'm, in Lex I'm from Lexington, Kentucky, and I'm in Lexington. And he asked me to come to his house, and he takes me up to his bedroom. And I'm like, good Lord, what is he about to tell me? Like that he's, you know... His marriage is falling apart. What's going on? And he takes me up there and he starts weeping about how stressed he was about money. He's like, I fixated on this house. You know, and I only knew, could only identify he was fixating because I did that stuff and still do it. None of us have arrived. And uh, so anyway, Journey, because she's growing, she needs new shoes every six months or so. So when growth is present, you need a new form periodically. When you're not growing, you stay in the same form decade after decade, maybe in the same spot on the pew, and guess what? There's no condemnation for you. That's okay. You can do that. But if you're some of us, like probably a lot of you sitting here, you're like, man, this adventure is a little too fun to stay in the same form all the time. And when you know he's with you, you begin to get more and more confident each form change that it's okay. And not only is it okay, you're following him. And that requires a willingness to change forms. If Journey was to stop growing, she would never need a new pair of shoes. But that previous pair of shoes was necessary to get her to the new pair of shoes. Are you all with me? So Jesus loves to come into our shoes, whatever size shoe we're wearing. Even if it's stinky and you got foot fungus, he's in there. Usually that happens when you've been in there too long. And then the waters are stagnant. They start to smell. And he comes in there and he lives with us so lovingly. In the fullness of time, Jesus, a man born under the law, came to redeem those under the law. So in terms of covenantal redemption, you didn't need redemption because you've never been under the law. That form was never yours. You were trespassing. But Jesus came just like God went into Egypt and busted him out. You know, I call it Death Star theology. Because if you watch Star Wars, has ever, anybody seen Star Wars? Luke has to go inside the Death Star to explode it from the inside out, right? So Jesus comes into, geek points, by the way, for that. <laughs> Jesus comes into the form that is the Mosaic Covenant. And so he was just like them, born under the law, just like them, adhered to the same ordinances and regulations just like they did. And met them there and lived with them there. But his intention was to take them to a new form. Now, we have some musicians in the room. And you all will get this illustration. But if you've ever written a song and then shown it to other musicians, you, you understand the first century Pharisees. Because those that have a vested interest in the current form of something will always come against those trying to bring forth a new form. So when you're a songwriter and you bring a song out and you take it to some people you respect and they're like, I don't like that form. Well, guess what? You were like, what do you mean? It's perfect the way it is. We don't need to change anything. I have a vested interest in the current form. So when you're coming against this form, I want to shut you up. So Jesus comes into the form, and he says, I'm about to bust you out of this form and give you a better one. And the people with a vested interest and in who were profiting off the current form, they want him to go away. 
and all the way unto death. So he comes into their form, but he doesn't intend to stay in that form. So he brings a new form. And Jesus comes, and while he's living with them, he begins to foreshadow this new form that's always been true. He starts talking about our Father. And he brings a new form that is a familial, where's Robin, dynamic. It was so funny last night uh, um, when we put the first post up, she wrote familia. And I was like, I was like, hey, Terry, it sounds like a Spanish meeting. <laughs> can, we, can we put the L on the end of familia? It's hard to say. I wish it was easier to say. So he, he starts dropping hints. If you think of the Lord's Prayer, they ask the Son of God how to pray. And his first two words are not holy taskmaster. They're not headmaster or judge of all judges. To pre-cross unrepentant Jewish people who had not said a sinner's prayer or met any sort of religious criteria, they've never even heard of it. He says to those people who haven't come to the camp meeting in the summer and rededicated on Monday night, when we had revivals, I went to two revivals when I was a teenager, and they were both exactly the same. Monday night was rededication night. You've been sinning all year. You know, it's like Lynn Hiles' impersonation. I know you've been sinning all year. You need to get up to the altar and rededicate. You know, and obviously we know rededicate, I don't think is even a word. Uh, you know, and scare them up to the altar to rededicate. And then Tuesday night is, you know, get everybody saved again. And Wednesday night was, you need to go into full-time ministry. Uh, which meant, as you know, it's, it's really close to how Dr. Heil says it was, you need to be preaching or singing. That was full-time ministry. Uh, and we know that's not true. So he comes into that form, and they ask him how to pray. And he doesn't pray to Abraham either. If you think those people, their trust was not in Jesus, it was in their natural lineage to Abraham. And you can see this in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. When the rich man is in Hades, we know not eternal torment, and, the, and it is a parable. We're not preaching on that today. But he says, Father Abraham, that is a picture that their trust was in their natural lineage to Abraham and not Christ. He doesn't yell out for Christ. He yells out for Abraham. And then you get to Romans chapter 9, and you see that Paul begins to list the reason, begins to list the reasons that the Jewish people believed they were the righteous people of God and God's elite. And he says, you had the covenant. You, meaning the Jewish people, not us. You had the covenant. You had the promises. You had natural lineage to Abraham. So, when he starts to pray, he doesn't say any of that. He brings everyone there into a family dynamic and says, our Father. If we really thought about those two words, it totally wrecks judicial theology. Jesus could have said anything right there, right? Did you think he said things by accident? No, but because a lot of us, we, we were taught so judicially, it was so many legal terms... Because we have a, a Bible, that word comes from the Latin Biblia, which means library of scrolls. It's not one book. No. It's a multivocal library of scrolls is literally what it, what it means. And so there's all kinds of contradictions and different views of God, right? Man, but if we had just known that, we talked last night about the contradictions and Man, I just, I talk to God for unending. Show me how that's not a contradiction. Show me, Holy Spirit. Show me, Holy Spirit. He never showed me anything. And then one day he's like, it is a contradiction, Jake. <laughs> and I felt like a heretic yet again. Jesus rips the ceiling off. And he's down there. He's like, if you want to come be with me, you got to jump down this ceiling. And I'm like, okay. Because I knew immediately I had my grace posse. Yep. Come on. Wow. A few things are slow to come through a grace revelation. Can I speak this candidly? 
I say it with love because I've lived this. Inerrancy is one of the last things to come through a grace uh, revelation because when you get a, a revelation that you're under grace and not under the law, you still have hell to deal with. You still have original sin. You still have inerrancy and infallibility. Um, you have eschatology. And so, but, but that uh, dogmatic hold on the way you see the scriptures actually is still very much alive in the grace camp. Um, so he says, our father, and brings everybody into a family dynamic. You know, Paul said in Galatians 2.21, uh, very famous verse in 20 and 21, that it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live through the life of Christ. I'm paraphrasing and misquoting, but you know the verse. And that word translated I, when he said it's no longer I who live, is the Greek word ego, where we get ego. So Paul said, my ego died, and the life I now live is egoless. So a familial revelation, if you really receive it, crushes ego, because in and out thinking is gone. And guess what feeds your ego? I'm in, they're out. That's a five-star meal for, the, for our ego that we're feasting on all the time. Well, thank you, Lord. I'm not like them. We're, it's the pharisaical prayer. We just lie to ourselves and say we're not the Pharisees. We read the Scriptures, and we need to also ask, am I? Don't ask, am I Jesus in the story of the rich young ruler? Ask, is it possible I'm the rich young ruler? Not with any condemnation, but just to say, am I still partnering with ego-based mindsets? Because our Father is a declaration, there's no us in them. If you want to pray a Christ-like prayer, you have to posture your heart first like He did. We're all included. Now I'm going to pray. <laughs> it's so powerful. But because we're transitioning, we're on the theological strand with, with the law and grace and eschatology and, and all the stuff that we have to go through, this is just camped out in the Gospels. So... All right, let me, let me share what... Are we okay on... Okay. Um, so we get to verse 4. He was, and so when they had broken through, they, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. This is how I thought this verse would read with my, with my theology about the cross. Essentially, I would read it when Jesus saw their faith... He said, well, I can release the product of forgiveness when someone brings me the payment of a bull or a goat, and I see some blood, then I'll forgive somebody. But this is before the cross. we got to think about the timeline. That, wow, I got quiet when that, when that heater went off. So the timeline is this is before the cross during the Gospels, which you've been well taught. You know that. And he does not demand blood to release forgiveness. And if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. And he doesn't do anything. He doesn't see the Father doing. And he doesn't say anything. He hasn't already heard the Father say. And he doesn't say, Ugh, I really want to heal this paralytic. But listen, we got a camp meeting next week. Listen, and on Monday night, I need this guy to rededicate. And I've got this thing called a sinner's prayer. And I know you don't understand it, but I need you to repeat it. And then you can have forgiveness. But he doesn't do that right there under our nose. If you read in 1 Samuel chapter 12, if you read in Hebrews chapter 10, Psalm verse 51, we won't turn there for time, but they all say God never wanted sacrifices. You delight not in sacrifices and offerings, David said in Psalm 51. Even in Psalms, that revelation is being released. But guess what? Jesus will live in whatever shoe you're in. When I got a grace revelation, I still totally believed that the reason that I was able to be saved is because God received a blood payment from my brother Jesus. You know, and I hadn't thought through that yet. I don't convince Journey, my daughter, that I'll never forsake her by having her watch me slaughter and forsake her brother in front of her. How twisted would it for me to then say, after I slaughter 
and, and, and get blood from my son if I looked to my daughter and said, trust me, have an intimate relationship with me. Now you can know I'll never forsake you. No. The way I would convince her that I'll never forsake her is by her watching me never forsake Harmon. And of course, you've been taught that Matthew 27, 46, when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22, 1. And, you know, and some scholars believe that he actually sang that. Now, that wrecks me to think about that, that Jesus was hanging on the cross and he sang the first line of Psalm 22, 1. And their custom was someone would sing the first line and they had the whole thing memorized. So they'd all start singing together. Now, picture the, oh, p- picture the cross. And I don't have a verse for this. I'm just going there because that was their custom. So all the people there start singing Psalm 22, 24 together. And they get to ver- what we know is verse 24, which to them is just part of Psalm 22. There's no chapters and verses, right? And then it says, you have not forsaken me. You have not abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. God was, God was in Christ, reconciling the whole world to himself. He's not divided amongst himself. He doesn't need blood. They needed to see it. That was the shoe they were in. So the shoe they were in at the giving of the law is that they believed deities needed blood to be appeased and needed sacrifices and offerings. So God's like, man, I don't want to give this to you. But it's the shoe you're in. And I want to connect with you, so I'll speak your language. We talked yesterday, you know, if you visit Spain, you'll connect with the Spanish people if you speak their language on a deeper level than if you don't. You know, if you travel to Europe or a foreign country and you don't know any of the language, you usually bring a book with common phrases so you can speak their language because you'll connect on a deeper level. So Jesus doesn't speak this language none of us can get. He comes into our limited understanding and language and lives there with us while teaching us. And then eventually we're like, oh, my gosh, you blew the whole ceiling off. And he's like, yeah, let's go higher. And I don't mean to say use higher, lower language. So um, I want to go to Mark 4.32, and then I'll, uh, because I was a, I was a pastor for six years, and, uh, you know, when you have one message, and now I haven't preached in, like, months. <laughs> so, I'm really, I feel, I'd, I want to honor your time. So, if you go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Here, I'll just pull it up. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. I know your pastor loves Ephesians. Let me get there. Well, I'll just read it. All right, Ephesians 4, 32. Is it up? Oh, it's already up there. Okay, thank you. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So we have realized that God did not need blood to release forgiveness, right? So if he did, forgiveness is a product. And the blood is the payment. And so it is a business transaction, Right? So even when you come into grace, you still believe essentially the cross was that business transaction, that Jesus was the payment. God committed child sacrifice. I mean, that's what our gospel was, which in Jeremiah chapter 7 and 19, he declares child sacrifice an abomination, something that never entered his mind. Yet our gospel is God committed child sacrifice so that he could accept his other kids. Well, he has to directly contradict himself to be the one who killed Jesus, you know. Uh, So we know that's not true. So in Ephesians 4.32, it says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So how did Christ forgive you? We just talked about it. Without a payment. So some of us struggle relationally with forgiveness because we still want a payment. And it's usually an apology. But that's not Christ-like forgiveness, that's paganism. So I want us as we're, you know, this church is pioneering the theological strand probably for this region. That may be a trigger, like prophetic trigger language, (laughs) you know. 
But, you know, I came out of that like, the region, you know, like always pumping people up, you know. It's weird because, like, I don't want to throw all the baby out with the bathwater, you know. There is something special happening there and here, and it's okay to believe that. Um, so, when someone has wronged us, a lot of times we struggle to really forgive them because deep down you're wanting them to bring a sacrifice on your altar. Which makes you a pagan deity. Nobody would want to say, oh, I'm a pagan deity, right? <laughs> At least you get to be deity, you know? So there's one... <laughs> you know, that's pretty cool. So, just to make it personal, you know, my dad left when I was three. He, he di- my mom and dad got a divorce. My sisters were uh, 14 and 16 at the time, and I was three. And, you know, that, that definitely hurt me. And I thought about it as I was growing up. Um, you know, why would dad do that? You know, he moved to Florida and started a totally new life, and I only got to see him for five or six weeks a summer from the ages of four to, you know, 16 or 17. And then I told him I didn't want to come anymore. Um, and I wondered why he did that. And then, you know what took it to another level? When my son was born. I thought I was doing okay with the whole forgiving dad thing. Wrong. I got so mad, guys. I would look at my precious boy and be like, how could you leave me? You piece of S asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. (laughs) We could say S triple asterisk. And I would be, and I would talk to Michelle, and she's like, babe, you've got to let it go. You've got to let it go. And I'm telling you, something was preventing me from being able to, and it was because I was still believing God needed blood. And so we walk out our picture of God on the relational strand over here. We're walking out our theological strand practically and relationally, and we're not even aware of it. And Holy Spirit, I was talking to Holy Spirit about um, my dad, and he said, do you want to know why you can't forgive him? And I said, yes. I really wanted that weight off of me. And he said, it's because you want him to bring you a sacrifice. To this day, he's never even gotten deep with me about what happened. Like, I've asked him a few times. I've even said, Dad, I totally forgive you. Will you tell me what was really going on in your head? Like, why'd you do that? I'm not even mad. Just tell me. I just really want to know. And so the sacrifice I wanted him to bring me was to give me understanding of why he did it and to say, it was a dual sacrifice, (laughs) he was sorry. So I was a pagan deity awaiting a sacrifice before I release a product to my dad. Now Now that you're sorry has appeased my level of needing to hear that, Now, I forgive you, Dad. You know, when I was saying, Dad, I forgive you, it was a ploy to get him to start talking. I didn't mean it. It was actually me manipulating him to try to get him to put his sacrifice on my altar. And he still hasn't. But I immediately started to cry, and I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you need a bull called apology is what I call it. You want him to bring a bull and sacrifice it on your altar, which is him saying he's sorry for leaving. And so that really messed me up and healed me a lot because I'm like, oh, if I want to be totally free, I have to forgive like Ephesians 4.32 says, freely. That, That original word means freely without payment. So if I'm going to release forgiveness that I've received, I can't be demanding a payment. That makes me a pagan. This is hard, God. He messed me up. I'm still mad. I know, son. I'm a crier, so if I cry, and it's okay for you if you tear up. You know, I know people in your life have done this type of thing to you. And when you, when you transition consistently theologically, this happens pretty often. Because you shift to another form with Jesus and you still have dear friends in the previous form. 
And a lot of times you really love those people, but they're not willing to come to the new form that you're in. And so it actually requires two-party maturity because you have to come to a place where they understand, you know what, my love for you is even bigger than your theology. What a thought. And you looking backwards have to say, you know, you're still in my previous form, but I love you. And if you're mature enough for us to still have a relationship, even though our forms are different, our, our theology is different, our beliefs are different, then I want that. But most of the time, uh, or a lot of the time, they don't want that. And that hurts because you love those people, right? And then the, 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 the bull we want in that case is for them. We say, when they finally shift to my theology, I'll be cool with them again. And guess what that becomes? Increasing weight. Because now you begin to believe it's your job to shift people theologically. And you do it without noticing. But then all of a sudden you're like, where'd the joy go from this form? This form had joy. It's gone. What happened? It's because you're so preoccupied with trying to bring people over to your form that you love from your previous forms. It's one of the reasons it happens. But it's not our job to bring them to where we're at. It's his job. And I know that sounds like Christian. it's Christianese, but our burden is supposed to be light, and he's equipped to do that, and we're not. Don't you want your joy back? I mean, um, so isn't it crazy? It's possible to have theology as amazing as Terry and Robin have taught here and still be kind of joyless. That's nuts. And in my life, I've found it's because I'm like, man, if you guys would just come over here and see what I see. Well, they're on their timeline. And what's amazing about Jesus is he's in that form with them as much as he's in this form with me. He's that big. And so if I want to be like him, I'm going to love him in that form like he does. And I'm not going to hound him about, listen to this YouTube video and this teaching and listen to the sermon from last week and this podcast. Because now you become a nag. Ah, you know? So God saying that to me, doesn't devalue the pain I went through. So I want to say that to you guys. If, you, if you're making this personal to yourself, you releasing that without a payment in no way devalues the pain you were put through. He affirms our pain, right? He was acquainted with sorrow, and so are we. We're not protected from relational pain. You know, and in word of faith, I thought, I mean, that's kind of what we were taught, but it's not true. It didn't work out in real life, so that form worked for me for a while. And it was liberating compared to growing up Baptist and thinking I was saved one week and damn the next. But it eventually became confining, and then grace came. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Man, it was liberating for a while. And then certain aspects of it started to feel like, man, it's closing in on me. Because Jesus has always taken the ceiling off. If you, want, if you want to follow him, just get ready. The ceiling's coming off consistently. And so this is what I've found, and I hope that you can relate to this. The more heretical I've gotten, the more I've matured. Now, I haven't arrived in maturity. My wife and kids will tell you that. Um, I tell my kids something I heard from an Australian man named Tony Fitzgerald, who's in his 80s. And he said, I tell my grandkids that I'm a kid just like them, just with 81 years. And I was like, that's awesome. So I tell my kids, I'm like, I'm a kid just like you, son. I just have 38 years and you have seven. I never stop being a kid. I'm just a responsible kid, mostly responsible kid. <laughs> I'm still a kid. They should have. We're very childish. Uh, yesterday, lots of laughs, though. Stuff I couldn't have laughed about nine years ago. Uh, but Jesus loved us through it. He got into our childish form yesterday. Um, so what you went through is not devalued. Jesus affirms that. But the question remains, do you want to break free? And so I really believe you have to realize that a Christ-like forgiveness is you not demanding a payment anymore. It's really forgiving them freely without payment and to finish, if it's okay, I'd like us all to kind of do that silently together, if that's okay. 
you know, so if you, if you want to close your eyes, you know, I don't want to be threatening in any way, but I do want us all to be free, me included. And if you, if you want to picture the people that come to mind, the people that you're struggling to forgive, first of all, realize this, this is not to devalue what they did to you. I know it hurt. But you can picture them. And, and you can say it silently or out, out loud. I'm going to say it out loud. You do what you want. I want everybody to feel comfortable. Jesus, I forgive these people without a payment. I don't need their apology. I want to forgive them as you forgave me without a payment. I release them to you. Even if you picture having them in your hands, having that, hold that pain in your hand and just hand it to Jesus. And, and just say, I, I don't want to carry this anymore, Jesus. It's yours. I release them. I want to be free. You know, and just to take it even deeper, you know what, guys? We didn't need to be forgiven. We didn't do anything wrong. The lyrics of that song, you all changed, and I and I felt the Holy Spirit so much when I read it because the original lyrics say, I didn't deserve it. And you changed it to, you insured it. Ian, like you made sure I knew that I deserved to be loved. And that always bugged me about that song. No, we do deserve to be loved. It wasn't that we were born needing forgiveness because of what a man did or didn't do 6,000 years ago. That doesn't even make sense, right? So thank you, Jesus. I hope you all were blessed. And I don't know if I'm under or over, but I feel like that was what I was supposed to do this morning.